My name is Sam Austin. I'm the director of the Evidence-Based Health Policy Project uh, at UW-Madison's Population Health Institute. Uh, as you can tell, we've got a full stage and a full program today, uh, but I want to take a quick minute to tell you a little bit about my project, the EBHPP, and uh, how did today's event came together and uh, what, we're, what we're hoping to accomplish. My project, the EBHPP, is an initiative at the UW-Madison to take evidence and expertise uh, which is generated on campus and in the community and connected to the health policy making process in the state legislature. This project is based at the UW, at the UW Population Health Institute, uh, which has the mission of translating research into policy and practice. Uh, and it's also guided by a advisory board of statewide health leaders, including Kurt Egebrecht from the city of Appleton, uh, who's here in attendance today. Uh, my project, the EBHPP, conducts a range of activities to advance uh, the goal of evidence-informed policy making including a long-running series of briefings at the state capitol and uh, informal support of policymakers uh, as they try to build data, evidence, information into their work. This grows out of the theory, which is based firmly in the Wisconsin idea that ongoing dialogue and interaction between lawmakers, academics, and the community will enhance the work of all three to advance the health of our state. The project is a partnership of the UW-Madison School of Medicine and Public Health, the LaFollette School of Public Affairs at UW-Madison, and the Legislative Council, which is the nonpartisan uh, legal staff for the state legislature. Um, project partner Steve McCarthy is the legislative staff attorney uh, at the Ledge Council. He's also here today. We receive funding and the ability to make these briefings free and open to the public from the Chancellor's Office at UW-Madison, the Wisconsin Partnership Program at the UW Medical School, and the Institute for Clinical and Translational Research also at UW-Madison. So the focus of my project is connecting expertise into state health policy. And even though I'm housed at UW-Madison, I know I don't need to tell anybody in this room that that process of building knowledge uh, and building uh, a knowledge base to improve the health of our state doesn't just happen on campuses. And it sure as heck doesn't just happen down in Madison. This process happens on the ground every day in every city, town, and village across our state uh, where people are trying to make it a little easier for their neighbors to eat a little bit healthier or making it a little less stressful for a family member uh, with a family member with dementia to make it through their day, or to reduce the day-to-day -day stigma that a child faces uh, who has a uh, mental health or substance use disorder. And that's why we're here today, to dive into that process of generating knowledge on the ground, and not to take a deep dive in any one particular topic, but to hear from different, different areas and different groups that are working to improve the health here in the Fox Valley, and ask them, how are they learning? Is it from their partners or from their clients? Uh, is it uh, through themselves, through evaluation? And how are they teaching and spreading those best practices? And hopefully at the end of today's program, we'll see some common threads among our speakers uh, and uh, try and pull some of those out. And as excited as I am for our panel today, one, one true regret of mine as I was setting this up uh, was not to be able to include the full range of uh, individuals, groups, and coalitions that are working every day in the community to, to improve health. So let's just put this to the test. Can you out there in the audience, raise your hand if your work, uh, if your work is focused on improving the health of your community in any, any ways. See what I mean? We could, have, we could have set up a panelist table four blocks long on College Avenue up in Appleton and still not fit all of you on there. So I really do see the six groups here as the tip of the health iceberg here. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for all the work that you do in addition to the work done here by the panelists. Obviously, another aspect of my program is enhancing the connection of the campus into the policy discourse. And though I'm housed at UW's med school, uh, we and our project define campus very broadly. And a great example of this is the importance to our state of the UW, UW colleges in their communities, uh, including our hosts here at UW Fox Valley, under the leadership of Martin Rudd. Dr. Rudd has been the regional executive officer and dean for the Northeast region at UW colleges since 2016 after serving in several capacities at UW Fox Valley since 2003, including professor of chemistry and dean of the campus. Dr. Rudd, thank you for your campus's hospitality uh, and your help in putting this event together, and I'd like to welcome you to the podium for several remarks. Good morning, and a warm welcome to the Perry Hall at the University of Wisconsin Fox Valley for today's conference on community health expertise in the Fox Valley. I'm delighted that you're all here today. By our very location in the heart of the Fox Cities and our identity as the University of Wisconsin campus in this area, we are superbly positioned to fill part of our mission, quote, to advance the Wisconsin idea to bring the resources of the university to the people of the state and the communities that provide and support its campuses, end quote. 
As well as being a state-supported institution, our facilities here, including this building in which you sit, are uniquely funded by a nearly 60-year-old partnership between Outer Gamey and Winnebago counties. Their investments, starting back on this site in 1960, have ensured that the University of Wisconsin in the Fox Valley has thrived, grown, and continues to meet the educational needs of more than 1,300 students that are enrolled here this semester. We are able to offer this and other spaces on campus to statewide organizations and local not-for-profits for performances and educational events such as today's, which will discuss high-quality research, public policy, and evidence-based methodologies. Our University of Wisconsin faculty here offer the students the same types of expert analysis, multiple viewpoints, and community perspectives in helping them ask probing questions and seek an in-depth understanding of the issues facing our state. It is how we embrace the transformative power of a liberal arts education in shaping our students who will transfer to complete baccalaureate degrees at our UW system partners. It is critical to have forums such as this to bring policymakers and a broadly defined community of health professionals to put a different outlook on their work-based knowledge and perspectives and how that's shared across the constituents. We may have some knowledge of the individual initiatives and groups that are represented on stage today, but what does that mean in terms of aggregate and reflective data for our legislators and decision makers in their continual cycle of development? To assemble such a quality panel of speakers today is impressive, and I would like to thank Sam Austin and his team at UW for his interest in involving us in exactly the type of collaboration that serves our community's needs. It's been several months of connectivity to bring this event together. I'd also like to thank Terry Perkins, the Campus Events Coordinator, for her logistical work today, and of course my particular appreciation to our local elected officials and panelists who have chosen to spend part of their day here. Again, a warm welcome to you all for this conference. You can follow all of the social media action today on Twitter at UW Health Policy and at UW Fox using the hashtag EBHPP. Enjoy your day and thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Rudd, uh, for those comments. A couple nuts and bolts things, and then we'll, we'll get started. First, your folders uh, that you collected on coming in today have uh, today's agenda biographies of our panelists and overviews of the EBHPP, the Population Health Institute, and the organizations represented on stage today. There's also a yellow evaluation form inside. Uh, this is our project's first attempt at this format of a uh, briefing, so your feedback is extremely helpful and will help us do this in other areas of the state in future years. So please fill it out and leave it on the registration tables on your, as you leave today. Uh, second, all program materials and video will, will be posted on our website. Uh, and emailed to everybody in attendance today. So if you did not register ahead of time online, please be sure to leave your name and email on one of the check-in sheets so you can get on that email list for the, uh, the video and the materials. And finally, I'll echo uh, Dr. Rudd's comment if you, for the social media savvy among you, uh, follow us on Twitter at UW Health Policy and join the discussion today uh, using hashtag EBHPP. With that, I'll introduce and pass it off to our legislator co-hosts. Thanks to all three of you for your participation today, uh, for your investment in the health of your districts and uh, your pursuit of an evidence-informed uh, approach to policymaking. Uh, I also recognize Representative Paul Tittle, who I believe uh, is in attendance today as well. Uh, first, we have Representative Mike Rorkast of NENA, uh, representing the 55th District. Representative Rorkast was first elected to the Assembly in 2014, following a career in human resources at Menasha Corporation and Oshkosh Corporation. He currently serves on the legislature's Joint Finance Committee and was the chair of the 2015 Speaker's Task Force on Alzheimer's and Dementia. He's also a proud graduate of uh, Michigan State, which we won't hold against him today. Um, joining him, we have Representative Amanda Stuck of Appleton. Uh, Representative Stuck was also elected to the Assembly in 2014 from the 57th District. She received her bachelor's and master's degrees from UW Oshkosh and has worked in previous positions, including with the Appleton Housing Authority. She is currently the ranking minority member on the Committee on Housing and Real Estate and also serves on the Energy, Natural Resources, and Jobs Committees. And a little inside tip, if you visit her office in Madison, you'll walk out with handmade dog treats, I believe. So a little, little treat there. And finally, we have Representative Dave Murphy uh, of Greenville. Representative Murphy was first elected in 2012 in the 56th Assembly District. He attended UW Fox Valley and owned a local agribusiness and several local fitness centers. He's currently the chair of the Assembly Committee on Colleges and Universities and is a member, among other assignments, uh, of the Standing Committee on Health in the Assembly. 
And a little inside tip, if you visit him when you're visiting the other two, uh, that there's a portrait of him and his friend Winston the Hedgehog, I believe, who is the mascot of the Winnicani Public Library. Is that, so then I, uh, I don't think Winston was able to make it today, but I have it on good authority. You can visit him on Tuesdays at the Winnicani Public Library, so mark your calendars for that. Uh, thanks again to all three of you for your participation, uh, and Representative Murphy, I'll have you come up to the podium and get us started. Thank you very much. Sam, you're a little taller than I am, so I have to pull this down. down. So, I, I think the first thing I need to get straight here is, is the uh, Winch, Winston the Hedgehog uh, story. So, uh, I represent, uh, in part of the, the 56th Assembly District is uh, the village of Winnicani, uh, and their library happens to have a hedgehog as a uh, uh, sort of a mascot, and they would keep him in a little plastic swimming pool <laughs> inside the library. And so I went over there one day to uh, uh, shoot some pictures for a poster on um, uh, trying to uh, get kids to, to read. And uh, so there's a picture with, uh, with me holding uh, Winston, very sort of gingerly. And uh, anyway, um, my son and his family uh, live in Winnicani, and so my grandson frequents the Winnicani library. And so there's this poster in my office with me holding the hedgehog, and my grandson walks into my office in Madison one day, and he says, Grandpa, what are you doing with Winston? <laughs> so he knew, he knew immediately uh, uh, who he was, and uh, so it was very cute. But it's really great to be back here at, at UW, UW Fox Valley. Uh, you know, things have changed a bit since I was here. 40 uh, plus years ago. Um, this particular facility looks a fair amount different. Um, I actually think it might have been a soccer field uh, back in the day, but uh, anyway, uh, it, it's, it's really great to get back here and, and see the, uh, the great improvements that have been made in this facility and uh, what a fine uh, educational facility it, it has become. So. Um, but I was uh, given the uh, honor to be able to come up here today and uh, introduce Sarah Wright. And uh, since February, uh, Sarah has been a program manager with Way to the Fox Valley. And I didn't know if there was any particular rhyme or reason to uh, how you decided who was going to introduce who, but... Um, my background, uh, before I got into the legislature, is I owned two women's uh, gyms uh, that were um, weight loss oriented. And so this is, this is something that is near and dear to my heart. And uh, so I'm, I'm very honored to be able to, to uh, uh, introduce Sarah today. Um, but Weight of the Fox Valley, it's a community health initiative to help people uh, be more active and to eat better. Uh, the group has private and public sector uh, partners. Uh, it functions in Calumet, Outagamie, and Winnebago counties. Uh, and the United Way is uh, a backbone of this organization. Um, before that, uh, Sarah was, the, uh, was with the Winnebago County Health Department. Uh, she's worked with farm to school programs. Um, and I would like to say that uh, I had a Lions Club meeting in Greenville uh, last night, uh, Sarah, <clears throat> and one of the projects that we approved was a, um, a $1,000 donation to an Eagle Scout uh, in Greenville who was helping to build a greenhouse at Hortonville High School so that they were able to grow some of their own um, fruits and vegetables uh, for the, the farm to school program. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. This is something that's catching on, I think is very important. Uh, Sarah's commitment to health uh, and the community is phenomenal. Uh, she has a, a, a great background. Uh, all, all the letters uh, that, uh, uh, that she has designations for, it, it makes quite a list. She's a, an RN MBA, 
So uh, that, that's pretty interesting that somebody uh, has that, that nursing background, also has the business background. Um, that's awesome. Um, so without any further ado, uh, Sarah, would you please come forward? Okay, thank you very much, Representative Murphy, for that great introduction. I really appreciate that, and also your support for this work that we are working together to do. Um, and also to all of you for taking time out of your Friday morning to come and meet together and talk together and, and work together, as that's really what this is all about, is how in community health we can keep this work moving forward. It's also an honor and a privilege to be on stage with some really amazing community health leaders in the Fox Valley, so we look forward to hearing from them as well. And really, um, I'm here to talk specifically about Way to the Fox Valley, which um, you just heard a little bit of an introduction to, but it is an initiative in Calumet, Outagamie, and Winnebago counties, and really, with um, it's a collaborative effort with a shared vision of a community that together achieves and maintains a healthy weight at every age. So I want to just briefly, you know, the, the challenges that we have with weight individually and as a community are not really a secret to anyone, but I did want to put one slide up here to really show how um, not only is the number of individuals with challenges in weight growing, so we have more individuals, but also if you look, this is overweight and obesity and the blue section is the obese, and that's also rising. So that means that even as individuals who are having challenges, we continue to um, do it worse and have it become more of a challenge for us. And that really drives us to come to work every day and say, how do we create an environment of health that supports people wanting to make that type of change? So with that, a brief history, back in 2013, um, through various community health needs assessments, community health improvement plans, recognizing partners in healthcare and public health and um, community health and the United Ways came together and said, you know, obesity continues to be a challenge. How do we come together and tackle this together? And 150 individuals um, came together for several days and really dove in and, and took a look. And from that, Way to the Fox Valley was born. And the decision was made to adopt the collective impact model for social change. It's a big problem. We got to find some great tools to help tackle it. And so here you see the five elements um, of collective impact and how Way to the Fox Valley has really adopted that. Um, the shared vision is that healthy weight at every age. Um, from shared measurement, we looked at BMI as an overall indicator of the health of the community to just help us see, kind of gauge where we're at and where we're going. Um, and the decision was made for three of our major healthcare partners in this area, Aurora, Ascension, and Theta Care, to share their de-identified data around weight and height and BMI and kind of where people live to some extent to say what does the problem really look like and, and how serious it is and help identify opportunities to do that. So agreements were made, that data is now being shared and soon we'll be able to have a little bit more insight into the actual a scope of this challenge that we face. Um, and then the last thing I'll just point out is the backbone, again, um, the United Ways of Oshkosh and Fox Cities came together and said, we need to provide that continuing support for this to, to work. Um, also, as we look at this work and we heard some of the introduction from Dr. Rudd, um, we want to make sure that how do we decide what to focus on? There's so much great work happening. I've had the privilege of working with many of you in this room and many other partners. There's a lot of great things happening. How do we focus our efforts on what's going to be the most impactful? And so these guiding principles really help us to check our work, to check what we're doing, make sure we're focusing on, focusing on things that have some evidence, that we have a health equity focus so we're reaching all community members. We really have a broad reach. You know, there's 400,000 400, people who live in the Tri-County area. And so how can we reach as many people as possible through the work that we're doing? Um, focusing on those policy systems, environmental changing, the changes that we talk about so much in public health. So. Way to the Fox Valley is governed in a variety of ways. We have a great leadership team of about 25 individuals from different areas across the region and all three counties from different sectors, including business, nonprofit, healthcare, public health, um, and just a, just a great group of people that help guide this work and meet on a quarterly basis to provide their insight and also connect us with resources in the area. We have a core team of great individuals, six to eight members of that leadership team who get together every other week to really help keep the work moving forward. 
And then we have action teams where we can connect partners all across the Fox Valley who are working to try to really get us to all kind of steer the boat in the same direction to achieve more together and to set goals and to work on these projects that we've um, approved. And then staff, um, myself, we're slowly trying to grow the staff of the backbone a little bit because as this work grows, we continue to need to make sure that we're able to address it. So again, back in the beginning when Way to the Fox Valley was forming, the decision was we're not going to start from scratch and reinvent the wheel. We know there's great work happening and great research that's been done. And so looked to the Wisconsin Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity State Plan to say what can we learn from that as a starting point. And what you see here is six of really the seven settings that were highlighted in that plan, the seventh one being home. But looking at these other six, how we can do work and that will extend into the home ideally. Um, and so that's really what then became for Way to the Fox Valley action teams. So those focus areas of the state plan become action teams. And I have, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, about four of those focus areas. The first one is um, active communities. So we know physical activity is an aspect of health and it's an aspect of um, our weight and also contributes to those things that weight affects like um, diabetes and heart disease and orthopedic challenges and all those things. And coming at this as a nurse, really kind of get to the heartstrings and say, we want people to live healthier and we can do that through things like physical activity, but creating an environment that makes it easier to be active. So a couple of projects that this group is working on, one is called Complete Streets, and we work in partnership with Melissa in East Central. So she's gonna talk a little bit more about their work, but um, really looking at our streets and saying, are they safe for all types of users? So people walking, do we have safe crossings? Um, are they well marked? Is it easy for people to go as our sidewalks or trails, um, bicycles, is there bike lanes, is there markings, is there, um, are motorists aware of bicycles and sharing the road with them? Um, and you know, even and wheelchair access and transit riders so that everybody can get from point to A to point B safely and also hopefully then be a little bit more active in the, in the, in, on the way. So wayfinding is really, how do we take the existing infrastructure of all those great things that we talked about and really improve the signage and how do people know where to go and how to get connected and raise awareness and be safe about it. So the next action team is um, the Early Care and Education. That group started meeting recently um, with a target on age birth to five and are looking right now at a couple of different aspects of health there. One is greater access to fresh fruits and vegetables where children are. So how do we inspire kids to develop those healthy habits from an early age to make it easier to continue and support that on the long run. And then also breastfeeding friendly environments, whether that's the work site or the childcare center or the community. Um, we know that breastfeeding is a protective factor for weight and health, both for the child and it also helps the mom. So those are the things we're looking at in that area. Um, the next one is the work site. We really want everybody to have opportunities to have healthy behaviors when they're at work. So access to healthy foods and not um, being constantly maybe tempted in another way. Um, how do we really create that supportive environment at work? People have an opportunity to be active. And so we, there's a, that's a challenge. You know, there are organizations that do it great, but there's also organizations that it's really hard. They don't have the resources or maybe people work shift work. And how do we identify those barriers and help people and help therefore more employees to have that access? The last one I have up here is food systems. And we don't actually have an active food systems action team right now, but there's a lot of things going on in this area that we do have some partnerships talking about. Um, potentially, you know, how do we have kids meals be healthier in restaurants? Um, we have an Eat Well for Less social media campaign I'll talk about and some other things that we'll, we'll get into. And then we also try to stay involved in those statewide partnerships like Health Tide, the Wisconsin Healthy Food Systems Alliance, you know, who else is doing this work that we can connect with. So this next slide is um, very full of, of words. So I don't, um, well, I won't go through it all, but just to show you that we're using the, um, the IHI driver diagram to really, um, how do we evaluate what we're doing? So we know in public health, we want to get out there and do stuff, and we want to change the world, right? But it's really important for us to learn, and that's part of why we're here today. You know, how do we learn from the work that we're doing, and how do we learn if we're doing it well and it's having an impact? And so... Um, the 
goal on the left here, the overall goal in this case is, you know, reducing the rates of childhood obesity, and then we look at different settings, and this one happens to focus on early care, and there's three primary or secondary drivers identified, including, you know, physical activity, breastfeeding, and nutrition amongst children um, in the early care setting, and then we're getting now to the level of the indicators. What are the indicators that we can identify, establish baseline, and establish goals and measure how we're, how we're doing. So for example here, you know, how many child care centers are actually designated as breastfeeding friendly? And there's a lot of great work already happening in our um, health departments there in public health, and how do we lift that up and, and extend it and do more? And um, also in the bottom one, you know, what's the percentage of redeemed WIC fruit and vegetable benefits? WIC is a great program, and we're getting fruits and vegetables out there. How can we help them achieve their goals? So these indicators are what we'll be looking at as we move forward and, and set those goals in those areas. So along those lines, we are working on a scorecard. So we're committing to having that come in January 2018 so that we can share with our community what we're doing and how, and how, we're, how well we're doing and then learn from that and tweak things or you know, steer a little bit to the left if we need to. Um, and so j I just have a few sample indicators listed here. I talked about the complete streets. So number of complete streets policies that are passed. So that would be if a municipality decided that when they have new streets or street reconstructs, they're gonna look at how do we make it safe for all users. Um, how many people are then walking and biking in those targeted areas? So we can look at that before changes are made and after and see what the impact is. Um, in the early care setting, I already talked a little bit about those indicators. For work sites, how many organizations are having worksite wellness and how many people are participating and how many people are seeing an impact there? Um, and then in food systems, it could be how many restaurants are offering um, fresh fruits and vegetables as the default side on kids' meals because we know that that impacts the choices that kids make when they're eating away from home. And then on the right, I have um, a school and a healthcare icon. So those are the other two action teams or focus areas that we while we do work in there, we haven't identified clearly the strategies moving forward, and so we'll be looking at that throughout the next year and also saying where might some indicators be there. We certainly do work in schools and have a lot of great school partners, and so how do we bring it together again and try to make more of that work? I wanted to share this slide just to show you. Um, this is There's 107 partners listed here. They all just came from our list of people who have some representation with through our action teams. So it's just a, a great list. We have even more partners than this, but it's, it's really neat to see the power of what we can do and how do we leverage that and really provide opportunities to take their work that they're already doing and, and maximize the value of that and bring it together to see those results and share it with our communities. So um, as far as you know, community connections, so in addition to working on all these big projects that we've been talking about, we want to be out in the community and connect with people and inspire people to change. And a um, couple examples of some early initiatives within Way to the Fox Valley. One is the Passport to Active Living, and over 2,000 people participated in that to really encourage them to use the existing trail systems and parks and be out there being active with what we have in our community. And then the pledge, um, we have this little pledge card that we take around with us just to encourage people to really pledge to change one behavior for their health. Maybe they decide they want to drink more water or eat more fruits and vegetables or walk more or whatever it is. Go to the gym as they plan to kind of thing. So um, just a way to, again, raise awareness and encourage people at the individual level in our community. Some other measurements that we do, we do have um, Facebook and newsletters. We gotta get those numbers up, so like us on Facebook, look for Way to the Fox Valley. Um, contact me about our newsletter or go to our website, waytothefoxvalley.org, and, and sign up for that. Um, but we are really trying to communicate with our community and share that information of what's happening, what work is, is happening with all of our partners, and how do we um, connect with that. So also, how many people are we reaching in the community and whatnot? This is our social media campaign, um, Eat Well for Less. We know people look to the, to the internet and to Facebook and things like that for, for that. We have partners in Appleton doing family dinner night, so they're doing education around cooking and whatnot, and we're working with them to help evaluate it. How do we measure the success and tweak it to be successful in the future? Another um, way we connect with the community is quarterly breakfast. Here's some sample. Um, different speakers. You can see Dr. Remington from UW was there, Dr. Christina Economos from um, Child Obesity 180, and some local partners of ours. So Melissa's there. We great to have different topics to help people connect in the community and learn from each other. 
We did a research study um, talking to people who have had weight challenges, what drives you? What are some of your challenges? Just one thing I'll highlight, you know, it's not surprising, this obesogenic culture that we have. So we are known in some places as being the brat capital or the, you know, the cheese curd capital of the world or the beer capital of the world, those kind of things. So we live in a, it, an environment that makes it challenging at times. So my last slide, I just wanted to share a little bit about in summary, kind of how do we share expertise with the community and how do we learn from our community? So one important thing that I, I mentioned earlier and I'll say it again is learning from that data. We get data from partners, we collect data on our own. We need to keep a focus on that. Learning from each other. Um, there, are, We have coalitions in the Fox Valley that are part of what we're trying to work with and I try to get out and, and meet with them too. Um, Rethink, Cahill, you can, um, at a statewide level, Health Tide and some of those others. Um, connecting with the community and then finally finding balance because this is something every day that challenges me. We want to be out in the community connecting with people, building relationships. We got these big projects we're trying to keep going and really trying to find that balance is really, really important and if we get down two ro one road too far, um, it ends up being too much. So um, I appreciate again the time today to talk with you and hopefully if you learned a little something about Way to the Fox Valley, I'd love to connect with you. My email is up there, sarah.wright at unitedwayfoxcities.org. Thank you. Thanks for that, Sarah. Uh, next, we'll bring up Representative Orcast. Great. Thank you for uh, coming today. And it's, a, it's really a testament to our community to see so many people that are very concerned about health care outcomes here in the Fox Cities. So uh, again, thank you for coming, because what you do every day in the various organizations that you're with, you are providing ways to improve not only the physical health of our community, but the mental health. And you're also here to help with the safety for our kids, and also to take care of some of the most vulnerable people in our community, and that can be the elderly, particularly those suffering from dementia. So you, uh, again, are a testament to the great services that exist out there already. And it's great to see you here because we all know that the work that we're doing isn't by far done. The needs continue to grow every day, whether it's for continued improvement in physical health, mental health, particularly for our children, and then again for our elder care. So those needs will be continuing, and it's great to see so many dedicated people helping those issues. Our next speaker, is I'd like to introduce is Paula Morgan, and she is the Director of Community Health for Theta Care, a seven hospital healthcare system in Appleton. Paula has led the system's community health improvement activities for the past 18 years, including Theta Care's community health action teams, needs assessment, implementation plans, and community benefit tracking. During her tenure, Theta Care has been a two-time finalist for the National Foster D. McGraw Award for Excellence in Community Services from the American Hospital Association. And uh, I, again, I would just add that Theta Care is a top-notch organization. I've used them personally and multiple times, either with my kids or myself, and it's always great to get their care. So without, uh, I'd like to introduce Paula next. Thank you. Good morning, and thanks to the UW and our legislators for hosting this morning. Uh, what a great opportunity to share what's going on here in the Fox Cities area. Um, before I jump into the slides here, I just want to share a quick story from early in the week. On, on Tuesday, I was driving home from work, and I was listening to NPR, and the speaker uh, that they featured was talking about how it's like next to impossible these days to get people to change their minds even with all the facts in the world. We're living sort of in this post-truth era at the time. And um, what she was suggesting is that really the only way to get people to think about possibly changing their mind is to give them experience, to get to be with people who are not like them, who are living something different than what they experience. And um, they were suggesting, this, the speaker was suggesting that we should ha host more, instead of foreign exchange programs, um, domestic exchange programs, where people um, in different parts of our country with different backgrounds go and spend time um, in other parts of our country learning from people 
Um, so people of different faiths spending time with people of different faiths, people of different colors with people of different colors, and um, big city, rural areas, and all of that. And it really made me think that, as I was anticipating today, that that's really what I'm here to share with you, is, is our model of how we go about community health, um, which incorporates something called the plunge. And the plunge is really, instead of a, a week spending time with other people that aren't like you, it's, it's eight hours spending time with people that aren't like you. And the amount of learning and understanding that comes from that process is really just incredible. So that's, in a nutshell, what my next uh, 13 minutes or so are about. So um, we got started with this work right around 2000. Um, United Way at the time uh, approached Theta Care for additional funding. And we're a huge supporter of United Way. We said, happy to do that. But we recognized our role as one of the largest health systems in the area and that we, we really felt that we could do more. And our CEO challenged us to do that. So we gathered some folks together, um, you know, and, and we did really kind of what um, you might expect us to do at that time is, is you know, we gathered all our experts, our doctors and our nurses and our rehab people and our dietitians, and we said, okay, you guys are the experts, you guys know health, what should we go do, do to the community? And that was kind of how we were, we were thinking about this work. And, you know, these folks came up with some great projects and initiatives, and we went and, and, and took them to the community. But we quickly learned that that model isn't very sustainable. So as soon as our focus on certain initiatives in the community, Theta Care's focus needed to change or move on to some other initiatives, those would die, and they weren't sustainable. We got wind of some work that was happening in South Bend, Indiana, Memorial Health System down there. And what they were doing was really different. Um, they were gathering the community to have dialogue with the community about what creates health. And they were doing some innovative things like um, downtown South Bend was really a blighted area. And, and the health system put resources into um, creating a community center in that downtown area and help got people um, access to jobs and education. And it's like, wow, I mean, that was really a, a novel concept 20, 20 years ago. Um, they also put us uh, onto um, a fellowship in creating healthy communities, and Theta Care paid for two folks, Dr. John Milkey and myself, as well as Peter Kelly with United Way, and somebody from our local school district to go and learn about, do this fellowship and what it takes to create a healthy community. And my big aha coming out of that was this notion that you can't solve a problem that you don't own. And our false thinking in our early model is that we as healthcare owned health of the community, when in fact, the, the health of our community is really owned by the whole community. And if you take a look at the uw Pop Health Institute and their model of what creates health, it really uh, fully supports that notion. Only about 20% of our health is, is actually created through the healthcare organizations in our communities. The rest of it is created where we live, learn, work, play, worship. It's our lifestyle and behaviors. It is those socioeconomic factors like poverty and access to jobs and income and social supports and all of those. And it's our built environment around us. So we knew that our model had to drastically change. And we had to do something that really engaged community in creating common understanding and common learning. So we created something called CHAT. And that stands for Community Health Action Team. This is the mission statement that we have for CHAT, which is um, that CAT chattelizes. Uh, catalyzes through education and collaboration, creative projects and opportunities that have the potential to significantly and measurably improve community health. So what is CHAT? Um, CHAT is, um, we, we have CHAT teams in each of our communities where we have hospitals. We have one in the Fox Cities and then five of our rural marketplaces. And the CHAT teams are made up of anywhere from 12 to about 25 community leaders. And they are from all different sectors of the community. We're not just talking about Healthcare, we're not just talking about government, we're talking about faith and education and business and um, uh, philanthropy and so all, all corners of our community. Because when you bring all those brilliant different perspectives together to study an issue in our community, the possibilities really sort of become endless and the thinking, it gets to be so rich. And um, the community recognizes these issues as, as community issues, not just um, healthcare issues. One of the, 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 the key piece, I guess, of our chat model is the idea of a plunge. And this is what I referred to early in my comments, that a plunge is, is basically, you know, we, we pick, each of, each of our chat teams in those local, local communities pick a topic once a year. And we take 
as many people as we can cram on that yellow school bus out into the community to go to several different sites through the course of the day to hear from people living the experience, whether it's domestic violence or homelessness or poverty or uh, childhood obesity or access to mental health services or whatever, whatever the topic might be. What we do is organize a day to help our community leaders best to get a sense of what it's like to walk in the shoes of people living that, that problem. We like to have about maybe 30, 40% of the folks on the bus for the day being people who are the experts. They get it, they're in the choir. But the rest we want to be people who really need to know about these issues because they have the potential to use their influence to really, really make a difference. We have done uh, plunges now on, uh, there are about 20 of them here in the Fox Cities over the years. Everything from uh, domestic violence, poverty, childhood obesity, smoking, understanding our LGBT population, understanding our undocumented Mexican population, alcohol and drug use, the, the list kind of goes on. This is a photo from a plunge we did in 2015, one of our most recent plunges, on what it's like to be black living in the Fox Cities area. And I gotta tell you, it was a pretty powerful day hearing from people share their experiences of what happens to them on a day-to-day -day basis in this community. It, it was eye-opening. So, um, so this, this morning is all about how do we create common understanding and common learning. So the, the real benefits of the plunge are, first of all, at the end of the day, people get it. You don't have to go boardroom to boardroom to try and convince a bunch of community leaders about the problem that exists. They got to see it firsthand. Secondly, stereotypes just sort of melt away because um, all of a sudden now when you're seeing people and hearing their story personally, you know, we all, we all probably have these stereotypes, whether we want to admit it or not. When, when you're sitting there hearing somebody's story in person um, and, and, and understanding the circumstances of how they really got to be where they are, um, you know, those stereotypes just sort of um, fade into the sunset. And then passions ignite. Um, it's really hard. I would say it's very hard for any of us as community leaders or for our legislators um, to, to go into our community and see the issues and not want to be personally engaged in helping to make a difference. So you walk out of the day with people who, who want to be part of the solution. As we go into the plunge experience, we really have three different goals. One is just education. If, if we have 60, 70, 80 community leaders from all sectors who walk out at the end of the day just knowing more about that issue of the day, um, isn't that fantastic? Because you know they're gonna use that knowledge to make better decisions as leaders in our community, whether inside their organization or, or out in the community. Um, and secondly, and maybe even most importantly, is this idea of connectedness. You know, what happens on the, the plunge day is that you might have a legislator sitting with um, the, the person who runs the domestic violence agency or runs Partnership Community Health Center or, um, you know, Theta Care CEO sitting with um, the leader in, of public health or whatever it might be. But all of a sudden, our, our, we know each other in our community and we build these relationships that all of a sudden now you feel like you could reach out and ask somebody a question or give them a phone call or you know, we could work on things together because you start to build that trust and social capital in the community. And people talk about the Fox Valley being this area where um, um, you know, it's really collaborative. And honest to God, I, I really believe that this having this chat model in our community for the last 18 years really has had something to do with that. And finally, at the end of the day, we, we always want to walk out with initiatives. What are we actually going to do about what we learned? And um, we always gather everybody who attended the plunge about a week or so later. Um, so we have 60, 70, 80 leaders who all think about this a little differently in a room. And we figure out what can we as a community do about this issue? Not what can Theta Care do? or what can our government do, or what can United Way do, or, yeah, but it's, it's about what can we do, because we all have assets and resources that we can bring to the table to make a difference. So some of the things that have come out of this model that exist in our community today, there's, there's lots of different things. I see Beth Clay is here. The NEW Mental Health Connection came out of two plunges that we did on mental health and access to mental health. And our chat model paid for uh, about 10 folks to go down to Tarrant County, Texas to, to after that, those plunges to learn about a model down in, in Texas. And we brought that model back and that's what the NEW Mental Health Connection is today. And it connects 64 different mental health agencies 
Uh, the Rural Health Initiative um, takes health care services to the farm in Shawano and Outagamie counties. That came out of a plunge that we did on, on um, the health of our uh, rural farm families. Uh, our Wapaka chat team recently did, a couple of years ago, did a plunge on drugs and alcohol, and that community didn't have a drug court. So as of actually this month, they are now starting up a drug court that came out of the plunge model. It's also one of the first sites in the state that started to use recovery coaches, which now is being is best practice, but um, it was one of the first areas to use recovery coaches. The advanced uh, Fox Valley Advanced Care Planning Partnership um, is a group that came out of a plunge we did on end of life and recognizing that so many people are dying without um, having their wishes for really how they want to write that last chapter of their life known or, or respected. So Ascension, Theta Care, Mosaic Family Health, and the End of Life Coalition all came together after that plunge to create one organization to move a common vision forward for what how, how we can work together both inside our healthcare institutions and in the community to um, help make that possible, um, uh, living with more dignity, dignity at end of life possible. And Voices of Men, um, hopefully you've heard about Voices of Men, about ending violence against um, women and children in our community. Another example uh, that actually got a, had a small start going in the community, but we did a, that plunge on domestic violence that just ignited the work and the interest behind it. And now there's a thousand men who gather um, every fall um, to um, help create a different culture that respects women and children. Um, Common Ground brings clergy together. Uh, a bunch of faith leaders got together after a plunge we did on diversity. And these faith leaders wanted to work on um, um, language and um, um, <clears throat> helping people learn the English language after a plunge we did in diversity. They decided they liked actually working together. So you have Muslim and um, Jewish and Catholic and Presbyterian and Methodist and you know a host of different religions around the table, but they put their theology aside and said, we want to be part of um, helping this be a healthier place for all. So they follow every year the chat topic that happens in the Fox Valley, and they work in their congregations to spread the word about that work. So um, last couple of points here. Um, um, it helps to have some funding with this, and we're fortunate enough through Theta Care that um, they put aside a portion of their margin every year to support this work. We have a fund in the community foundation here, as well as one within our organization. So we are able and in a position that when our community has great ideas, that we can put some seed money on the table to help make those ideas become reality. And uh, last, last slide, keys to uh, success for this. So again, this morning is all about um, uh, creating knowledge and understanding and how do we spread that. So I, I, I think that this model is one that because of the sheer number of people in our community that it engages uh, and from all sectors, it, it just innately creates that common understanding and shared knowledge that happens. So um, that, that's a huge key to the success. We have paid staff to support the work, um, so the ideas that come out of it, um, we have people who are there being paid to kind of dog the work and make sure it happens, which is a big difference from many of many of the efforts, good efforts in our community are volunteer-led, lots of great hearts and great people who want to do good work, but um, they also have day jobs, and, and that's a real difference with the model. And finally, we have some resources to be able to put on the table to um, help um, you know, spark the ideas and it sends a message to other potential collaborators that were serious about the work. So that's our model. Look forward to your questions later. Thank you. And next we'll welcome Representative Stuck. Well, thank you. It is an honor to be here with you all today. And I will say, since the dog biscuits were mentioned, a huge component of health for me personally is my three dogs. So uh, glad that that was brought up. Uh, I have to say that it makes sense that the uh, Ledge Council and UW System would host one of their first briefings outside the Capitol here in the Fox Valley, because we really do partnership well here. And we really are a model and, quite frankly, a lesson for other parts of the state and even the legislature sometimes on how to work together and uh, 
how to partner and how that really can make your community better and really help address issues in your community. Um, you know, it is really neat to see that we have businesses, we have healthcare systems that recognize that health is more than just about your doctor or your insurance plan, that it is about those socio socioeconomic factors. Uh, it's about what is going on in your community and that truly if we want healthy people and we want healthy communities, we need to address all of those factors. And certainly as legislators, we don't make policy in a vacuum. We need to hear from people who are actually working on these issues on the ground in order to make good policy. So it's really important that we do have discussions like this. So with that, our next speaker is Bonnie Schmidt, Assistant Dean and Director of Evaluation and Projects at the UW Oshkosh College of Nursing. She oversees the Center for Nursing Research and has taught courses in community health, ethics, and leadership. Her research background includes professional nursing values, diversity in nursing, and older adults. After Dr. Schmidt's presentation, we will have a break for questions from the audience. Thank you. I'm privileged to be here with such an awesome array of legislators and community agencies um, and our valued partners. And I want to talk to you about how we work with the community to teach evidence-based practice in nursing academia. First, a little bit about UW Oshkosh and its College of Nursing. UW Oshkosh started as a teacher training school in 1871 and grew into a comprehensive university with an annual enrollment of nearly 14,000 students. Within our university, there are four colleges and multiple majors or fields of study. However, about 20% of the incoming freshmen declare nursing as their major, we think mainly due to our reputation as a school of nursing. The university mission statement includes these words, innovation, research, community engagement, and sustainability. We envision ourselves as a research-enhanced comprehensive university. The College of Nursing was founded in 1966 with a mission to provide excellence in evidence-based practice, research, and scholarship. Our vision is community and evidence-based to develop caring and scholarly nurse leaders who positively impact local health care. The College of Nursing's undergraduate and graduate programs offer many options that incorporate evidence-based practice and hands-on clinical training with the latest technology and equipment. Our graduate program offers master's degrees for nurse educators and clinical nurse leaders. We also offer family nurse practitioner doctoral degrees, the Doctor of Nursing Practice, or DNP, and a brand new certified registered nurse anesthetist option at the doctoral level. These advanced practice nurses help educate the future nursing workforce and provide nurse practitioners and nurse anesthetists for Wisconsin, especially in underserved and rural areas. We also offer several options in our undergraduate program, a traditional Bachelor's of Science, or BSN, in nursing, an accelerated online Bachelor's to BSN program for second degree students, and I'm happy to say Sarah Wright is a graduate from our accelerated program, and a Bachelor's degree program for nurses with an associate degree called BSN at Home. Our College of Nursing is accredited not only by, through the university accreditation, but by the Collegiate Commission on Nursing Education, and now the Council on Accreditation of Nurse Anesthesia Programs. Our pass rate for the NCLEX RN licensure exam is 96%, well above the national average of approximately 83% for US educated first time test takers. For our graduate program, the certification pass rates for family nurse practitioner was 100% in 2015 and 2016, and for clinical nurse leader certification, 100% since 2009. We are Wisconsin's largest school for baccalaureate nurses. 
in the academic year 2015 through 2016, the College of Nursing had 255 graduates from its undergraduate and graduate options. 90% of those remained in Wisconsin after graduation. In our nursing program, an academic librarian works with students through each semester to build on their ability to retrieve health information from reputable sources. Instructors reinforce evidence-based practice in clinical and classroom courses. In addition, the students take an informatics class so they understand how information technology can be used to support decision making in clinical practice. Nursing Central software on the students' mobile devices includes point of care references such as laboratory and diagnostic manuals and drug guides. Multiple assignments require information retrieval and application such as scholarly papers, teaching projects, classroom discussions, clinical conference, and evidence-based patient care plans. All undergraduate students of nursing are required to take an evidence-based practice foundational course in their sophomore year. Junior students do a community teaching project, and senior students do a service learning project. This service learning project focuses on healthcare populations in the community and is called an aggregate project. Examples of aggregate projects are a referral and support program for under uninsured persons in a homeless shelter, assessment of children in a special needs program, immunization promotion, and a colon cancer screening awareness program. In our Honors College, students work collaboratively with, collaboratively with faculty on a research project before they graduate. Lastly, all graduates, students in our doctoral nurse educator and clin clinical nurse leader programs complete a scholarly quality improvement project in a hospital or primary care setting in our community. Examples of graduate Quality improvement projects are a breastfeeding support program for women returning to work in a, after childbirth in a major healthcare system, and a collaborative program between hospitals and clinics to prevent hospital readmissions. I also have a graduate student currently working with a program in the community to promote mental health in adolescent in our community. Our Center for Nursing Research offers an array of support services for students and faculty research. In addition, faculty collaborate with community partners to generate new knowledge. An example of a collaborative research study includes the outcomes of a specific treatment for chronic pain in a local pain clinic. Another collaborative study is the impact of a cycling program in a long-term care facility called Cycling Without Age. We're always looking for more opportunities to collaborate with community stakeholders in research studies. Students disseminate knowledge in semi-annual scholarly project presentations and aggregate project presentations. Annually, the university features scholarship in events such as Celebration of Scholarship, Awards Night, and the Provost Summit. Faculty ex are expected and do publish their research in peer-reviewed journals and present in local, regional, and national venues. Now, how do we involve our community partners and evaluate what we do on a daily basis? We partner with community stakeholders to evaluate and improve student preparation for clinical practice in many ways. Our Board of Visitors meets twice yearly and includes representation from several healthcare organizations in our community. We've made changes to our curriculum as a result of Board of Visitors' input. We work with our clinical partners, some of who are here on the stage today, um, to place our students in clinical settings through organizations such as the Fox Valley Healthcare Alliance. Staff nurses and nurses who serve as preceptors to our students are invited to our annual partnership council meeting. 
In addition, we offer our nurse preceptors access to the Polk Library and its online academic databases, as well as opportunities to continue their education. Lastly, we evaluate and involve our community partners through annual alumni and employer surveys. So the takeaway points is that we have a strong connection with clinical partners through students and faculty to try to respond to community needs. We require students to apply evidence to practice and encourage our fac faculty to conduct and disseminate research. So thank you for listening to my presentation. And um, I can be reached through the UW Oshkosh website or the materials here if, you, if you'd like to reach out. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bonnie. I think in the spirit of the Packers opening weekend, we're gonna call an audible here on the Q&A time. I just try and keep us on track. Uh, and do a little combined Q&A for the whole panel at the end. So instead of a Q&A, I'll uh, invite Representative Stuck back up to the podium. <laughs> All right, so our next speaker is really one of my very favorite people, and we're so lucky to have her here in the Fox Valley. Uh, so she is Marin Peterson, Executive Director of the National Alliance of Mental Illness, Fox Valley, where she leads NAMI's education, outreach, and support activities. She is on the Board of Directors for the League of Women Voters, Appleton, and holds a law degree and certificate in nonprofit management. Prior to returning to her hometown of Appleton and joining NAMI Fox Valley in 2014, she practiced law with a focus on antitrust Trust and trade. So help me give a warm welcome to Marin. Thank you, Amanda. And, and you're one of my favorite people in the Fox Valley, too. <laughs> Let it be said. Uh, you know, so one of the things Amanda just mentioned is that my background is as an antitrust lawyer, and that's how I spent the first decade plus of my career. So I what that means is I spent that time in the offices of CEOs and salespeople or sitting at board meetings of large corporations or counseling clients in other ways and saying, don't you share any information with anybody else in your sector, right? That was my job. <laughs> And so when I decided that I didn't uh, want to spend the rest of my life practicing law and kind of thought about what I wanted to do and ultimately decided that nonprofit administration was what I was interested in, um, which made sense for a lot of reasons and I was happy to do it and I got into it and I thought, okay, let's go. And everyone said, so what are you doing? What are your numbers? And I thought, whoa, don't you share any information. And so it took me a little bit. <laughs> but I am happy to say that I am here today to talk about what has become my favorite thing to talk about. And I know you're all a little bit bored. You've been sitting here for like an hour, and you're like, tick tock. But collaboration is exciting. And collaboration is what makes the Fox Valley and the Fox Valley nonprofit community tick. It's what makes us able to do what we do. I mean, I see a lot of friendly faces out there. I know I have a lot of colleagues out there from other nonprofit agencies, and you know what I'm talking about. If we sit there in silos, we're not going to be able to accomplish anything, right? So this is it. This is what it's all about. So let me tell you a little bit, back up and tell you a little bit about NAMI Fox Valley, because I know a lot of people have heard of NAMI Fox Valley, and you know we're mental health related, but what do we really do, right? Uh, I'll tell you what we don't do first, because that's probably the easiest. Uh, we do not do any clinical work. We do not uh, have therapists. We do not have psychiatrists, psychologists. We do not provide counseling. Uh, we collaborate heavily with those who do and are very, very appreciative of that work, but the niche that we fill is a little bit different. We uh, provide education, we provide support, uh, we provide outreach to try to break down the stigma associated with mental illness and to make sure that those who are living with mental illness and their families receive the support that they need and receive the connections to resources that will be helpful for them also. So NAMI actually is a, a grassroots organization. It's the largest grassroots mental health organization in the country. And what that means is it didn't start from the top up. It started 
from or the top down. It started from the bottom up. It started by people across the entire country who had family members living with mental illness, starting these quiet conversations with one another, uh, collaborating with one another to form little groups to share education and provide support. And then they realized that was happening all over the country and they started to connect to one another and the groups became a little bigger and ultimately one of the groups, and it happened to be a group uh, right here in Wisconsin, in Madison, thought, you know, we hear this is going on in other places. Why don't we see if we can learn from these other groups? Why don't we see if we can reach out to other groups across the country and see if any of them would be willing to talk to us? So they put the word out and they decided they were going to have a meeting in, in Madison. They were going to have a speaker and they thought, you know, yeah, maybe we'll get, you know, 30, 40 people to attend. We'll learn a little bit. And we can start thinking about what to do. Well, you know what? Over 200 people came from all across the country, from over 70 different communities. And that's when the National Alliance on Mental Illness was formed. So our background and our history stems from sharing information, stems from collaboration. We wouldn't be here without it. NAMI Fox Valley itself was formed in 1981 and uh, was formed as one of the very small NAMIs, as almost all NAMIs are formed. Uh, you know, a few very dedicated people uh, meeting in a church. Uh, and today, in uh, 2017, which I can't believe it's 2017, but it, but it is, and here we are. We are one of the largest NAMI affiliates in the country. Uh, we served over 17,000 community members last year through over two dozen programs, including over 27 support group meetings every month, uh, dozens of educational programs ranging from half-day programs on uh, something like crisis de-escalation or a specific topic to three-month-long programs training people to provide peer support and everything in between. One of the programs that we're most excited about recently, because it's pretty new, is Iris Place Peer Run Respite, which we opened in 2014. Now, Iris Place is a five-bedroom, uh, it's, it's a house is what we call it, but it, it's in the old St. Bernadette Convent, so it's pretty large, but we've done our best to make it very homey, and individuals who are experiencing crisis or uh, mental health or substance use challenge who really just need a chance to step back, get peer support from somebody else, and uh, kind of evaluate where they're going to go next and take care of themselves, are able to, to stay there and do that. And the, the uh, house is staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year with certified peer specialists people who have walked in the shoes of the people they're talking to who are staying there, people who live well with mental illness or substance use disorder. And so we're really, really proud. It's been a very successful program over the last few years. We've had over, we've had about 300 guests now, I think, and the warm line calls that we get in, um, the peer specialists also take calls from individuals who don't necessarily want to stay, but they want to talk. We have had, uh, I think, over 4,000 now warm line calls. So we've been doing great work, but when you back up and think about why we're here today, what I want to tell you about Iris Place is how we got there. Because we're just a mental health organization. We're not a housing organization. We hadn't operated any kind of facility, anything close to Iris Place. So when the opportunity came and the state of Wisconsin put out a request for proposal looking for three different peer-run respites to operate in the state, and we were so excited because it's something we'd always dreamed of doing, we applied, we got one of these grants, and we thought, great, but how do we do it, right? Well, not alone, not in our silo, that's for sure. So we gathered an advisory board, a steering committee of people from all different parts of the community, uh, from housing organizations, from the counties, from the healthcare, from the Appleton Police Department. And it was through all those people working together that we were able to establish the basis to get Iris Place off the ground and have a program that has become a really wonderful, functional program that is really changing lives in the Fox Valley. So while NAMI's name is on the program, it's not just NAMI's program, it's the community's program. We were just the ones to pull people together to get it up and running, which is really exciting. Um, so I also want to talk a little bit about, I, I could go on for hours about specific programs NAMI offers, but instead of doing that, oh, you know what, I'm not a PowerPoint person, I, I, I apologize. Is that okay, Sam? All right. I, I did have a couple slides, but they were mostly art. 
Uh, so I want to talk about uh, the collaborations that, that we, uh, okay, he's telling me you put my name up at least. There we go. <laughs> Some of the collaborations that we do, and because our programs um, that, that we developed, that Army National developed or that we developed independently, um, play into the, pro the collaborations that we're a part of. And so uh, I will talk about three collaborations today. Uh, there are many more that we're involved in, but these are three that are especially big, successful, and we're really proud of them. The first is our E3 collaboration. And I see Lisa Kogan-Praska of Catalpa and Jen Parsons of Samaritan sitting in the audience. E3 is a collaboration among Catalpa, Samaritan, Nami Fox Valley, and the Hortonville Area School District. United Way also is a silent partner through their PATH program in the, Hort in the uh, E3 program. Um, so E3 is a program that aims to create a culture of mental health and wellness throughout the entire Hortonville Area School District. From the kindergartners, through the seniors in high school, through all the staff and administration, and the parents as well. And when you look at the people, or the organizations that came together to make this happen, uh, Catalpa, which provides amazing mental health care and treatment to, uh, to children, and Samaritan, which also provides treatment but also has this awesome screening program where they're able to, to screen kids to identify kids who potentially have mental health challenges and need treatment, and NAMI, who provides education and support and outreach, none of us alone could go in and create an entire culture, culture of mental health and wellness in this school district. But we got together to talk about it, spurred by the school district, who's very supportive of mental health. And it turns out that the sum is so, or the whole is so much greater than the sum of the parts. So what happens with E3 is Samaritan screens every student in the entire district to see if they have any kind of mental health issue that might need to be addressed. If that student screens positive, Catalpa is there, embedded into the schools, providing the, the counseling, the therapy that students might need without those kids having to leave the school, without their parents having to leave work and come pick the student up. And NAMI's there holding support groups for both students and parents, providing education in the classrooms about mental health to break down stigma among students and to get them talking about mental health and get them to know what they need to do if they or a friend are suffering. And together, when we put all those three things together, and the data is showing us that we are making a huge difference in Hortonville. We are creating that culture of mental health and wellness by working together. Another collaboration that we're very proud of is another collaboration with Samaritan, which technically does not have a name yet, but we affectionately refer to as El Centro. And this is Samaritan Counseling Centers and NAMI Fox Valley's effort to create a center for Spanish language for Latino mental health. And again, it's bringing the best of what we both have to offer. But let me tell you a little bit about that, how this got started. How it got started is NAMI, the national organization, came up with an outreach program called Compartiendo Esperanza. And this was a program to go out into Spanish-speaking communities and teach a little bit about mental health and try to, the stigma is very high in the Latino communities, try to break that down a little bit and get the conversation started. And we thought that was a great opportunity for us to bring that to the Fox Valley because we do have a, a very large Spanish-speaking population. So NAMI Fox Valley did that. We started going out and having these presentations in Spanish and talking to the Latino community. And then we realized, as, the, as members of the Latino community started listening and starting to say, okay, we wanna talk about this, we didn't have anything to give them to go to next, right? So we realized we can't be out there offering this outreach program if we don't have follow-up resources. So we started thinking, okay, we're gonna to have to have Spanish language support groups, Spanish language education. We started to make those plans, get the, as we're hearing feedback from the Latino community, we're developing that, and then Samaritan calls us up and says, hey, so all that outreach and education and support you're doing, you do know that's gonna increase the need for Spanish language counseling, right? <laughs> oh, right. So Samaritan and NAMI started talking, and we don't have in the Fox Valley the Spanish language counselors that we need. So what can we do? How can we work together so that that service is provided for the people who engage in our outreach programs? And lo and behold, a year later, we have a joint 
program, a, a center for Latino mental health, where you can get your one-stop shop for Latino and Spanish language support groups, educational courses, and right there you can get the counseling from Samaritan Spanish-speaking counselors, which they have now been able to recruit a new great one over the last month. So I know I'm running short on time. I'm going to skip over the third collaboration I was going to talk about, but I, I encourage you um, to please contact me, look at our website, reach out. We're really proud of our collaborations, and it really is at the heart of what we do. Uh, but I do want to say, before I wrap up, that it's not just about the formal collaborations, uh, because those are really important, and they're very helpful, and we get concrete data from them. But, and, and Paula talked a little bit about this too, it's, it's the informal uh, networking and collaborating of ideas and knowing enough people and enough organizations that know what you do and you know what they do that you can pick up that phone at any time. I view the other leaders of nonprofits in the Fox Valley as not just my peers, but my colleagues. I, you know, these are the people that if I'm wrestling with a problem I don't know how to solve, I pick up the phone. And you know what? There's always somebody at the end. That's the pleasure of living in this community. So uh, I encourage you, please, get out there, collaborate. If you want to collaborate with me, let me know. We're up for it. We just want to make, we're at the 10,000 foot level. We all have the same mission. Everybody in this room has the same mission which is to make life better for the people of the Fox Valley community, right? So let's do it together. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Maren. And she's right, she had some nice art in the, yeah, that's okay. That's, and I'll pass it back to Representative Rorkast. Our next speaker is, uh, somebody who I think you'll be very interested in hearing what she has to talk about, and that's the Fox Valley Memory Project. Uh, Lynn Ann Clausing rush uh, she's the program coordinator for that program, and if, if you haven't been aware of it or don't know the details, please do look into it after you hear from her. I think you will find it is, one of, it is a best practice for providing care and services for individuals and families that are dealing with dementia. Their organization was very helpful to the task force that the legislature uh, worked or um, uh, used last session, and they, they really provided what I could say, again, is just top-notch, best practice. They are a model for what all communities should be doing. So with that, Lynn Ann, would you please join us? Good morning, everybody. I want to um, thank everybody here for making the uh, providing me the opportunity to be here and represent on behalf of the Fox Valley Memory Project. Um, listening to Maren talk about her past experience and what she did in her past life um, in her career uh, made me think a little bit. Um, I'm coming to the Fox Valley Memory Project. Um, I've been with the Memory Project for less than two years. So what did I do before? I spent 37 years as an administrator with the Federal Department of Agriculture. Those rooms um, where my offices were were full of books of procedure. We followed procedure. We didn't innovate. We didn't create. Um, and this has been such a change and a pleasure for me to be able to you know, be creative and to um, collaborate and come up with ideas and make changes and tweak things, which that did not happen as, um, as in my prior career. So before I start with our program, I want um, to ask people to think about why it is so important to live well with dementia. Um, for a moment, imagine losing your ability to do the things you love. You can no longer travel to, to, to new or favorite places. You can no longer be left alone with your grandchildren for concerns of safety. You no longer can have the ability to play cards, volunteer at places you always have volunteered at, to garden, or do any of the other things you have done in your life. How does that make you feel? Those are the losses and the concerns that persons with dementia face on a daily basis. So our goal for the, with the Fox Valley Memory Project is to help people live well with dementia. That includes providing compassion, understanding, education, support, accepting people, 
including them, providing meaning and purpose, and finding joys in the moment for everybody. Uh, some of our components are our memory cafes. Um, our memory cafes are an opportunity for persons with dementia and their care partners to be in that community, to make connections, to feel accepted and find joy and connect with others in similar circumstances. At the present time, we host 10 memory cafes at nine locations in the Fox Valley area. We have attendance between eight and 40 participants, depending on the location and the programming. Each cafe has a unique flavor, with many participants visiting multiple cafes each month. These cafes are supported by professional volunteers from all areas of the older adult community, as well as uh, many um, volunteer volunteers that support memory cafes. The link that will be in your material will give you a schedule of our most recent memory cafes and the programming we offer. Another one of my roles with the Memory Project is to um, staff the Memory Loss Resource Center. In the Memory Loss Resource Center, we um, support, provide support resources to persons with dementia, their family, their friends, their care partners, and other professionals working with persons with dementia through in-person meetings, support groups, phone calls, and emails. Um, we average, we have averaged 45 persons or families that we provide support to each month. We did an assessment of what I've done in the last two months, um, and these requests are continuing to escalate, and we're currently responding to 57 duplicated requests per month. These are persons that are reaching out for help because they have or are caring for somebody with dementia. Um, these requests come from local health providers, they come from faith communities, home health care agencies, assisted and long-term living facilities. Another one of our um, uh, focuses is our Purple Angel business education program. To date, um, we have trained, it's now 140 businesses on how to be dementia friendly. We educate these businesses on how to recognize dementia and best ways to communicate with persons with dementia. They're also a source of financial support for us because many times these businesses get on board and will support the Fox Valley Memory Project with our programming. They're also support of cafe programming and many referrals to the Memory Loss Resource Center and to our REACH program, which I'll talk about a little bit. People want to do things they have always done before they had dementia. They want to shop. They want to go to the bank. They want to recreate, go out to dinner in their community. This Purple Angel business training gives businesses the tools to support and educate their staff, as well as serve their customers in the best way possible. We do partner with Mosaic Family Health, um, where two of our founding members are on staff, Dr. Vogel and um, Beth Belmore. And at that site at Mosaic, we offer um, assessments to screen, evaluate, and diagnose the cause and type of dementia. Those findings are then discussed with persons with dementia and their care partners, and then again, provided back to their primary care physicians. We are also involved with a program um, developed by the Rosalind Carter Care Institute. Um, this is an in-home program that supports the care partner by addressing issues such as emotional well-being, stress management, and troubling behavior. And in that program, a, a certified caregiver actually goes into the home to provide resources and support for care partners. So how did we learn what we learned to bring this to the Fox Valley? Two of our founders, John and Susan McFadden, learned about the existence of memory cafes from Facebook. Um, Susan's interest in research were related to her role as a professor of psychology at the UW Oshkosh. Um, her connection in 2010 was an online forum where persons from all over the world shared their dementia experiences. Susan reached out to strangers in England to learn more about the programs in the UK, including memory cafes and Purple Angel programs. They then were invited to visit the UK in the summer of 2011. So what did they learn there? They learned about memory cafes with roots in the Netherlands. That concept began in 97 as a way to break through the stigma of dementia. There are many resources online, and most existing programs are very enthusiastic about sharing what they have learned, and we try to extend that same to people that are trying to learn to develop programs in their community. They also learned about the Purple Angel, um, or Dementia Education Awareness Program. There was a gentleman in the UK whose name is Norman McNamara who had dementia, 
and he was a driving force behind the creation of a dementia-friendly community. The businesses that he worked with, that he always went to, didn't understand him. He didn't understand his dementia. They could not communicate with him. So together with a lady named Jane Moore, they produced the design of a Purple Angel Dementia Awareness Program. When you're out in the community, we have wonderful partners that are educated, and you will see a symbol that is a purple angel. And I'm wearing one. I should have thrown a slide together with one. But the businesses with the purple angels in their windows have been educated on best ways to serve their customers. So how, did, how, did, how do we learn? You know, how do we tweak? How do we change? Um, primarily, um, one of the things that I really learn about learn how to, to change my job and to serve my customers and my participants better is to listen to their needs. Um, we had a call for more socialization. People wanted to be together. They have finally made friends again they, because they've lost their friends. They didn't understand their dementia. So we've had an extension of memory cafes. We now take bus trips, um, specialized bus trips designed for persons with dementia. We do theater outings right here. The university theater program invites us to their dress rehearsals so people can go to the theater without the stigma of somebody sitting behind them or next to them um, being annoyed or irritated that they're singing when it's inappropriately. We can attend dress rehearsals. We partnered with Xavier for their Christmas stars and their passion play. Um, so wonderful collaborations. Um, once a month, we hang out at Pizza Ranch for about two hours. People just come. We don't have a program. They just come to socialize and talk. It's just amazing. Um, we do internal assessments, staff reflections. Often I'll look at myself and I'll go, well, that didn't work. What do we do, need to do differently? How do we tweak that? How do we change? And we have wonderful resources that I can talk to and say, all right, what's a better way of doing this? Um, we do participant surveys. And um, I didn't put them on a slide, but we, um, have, we measure increased community integration and improved sense of well-being. And we've been very successful by doing um, annual surveys with our participants to um, see that we are seeing success in these, these um, outcomes. Um, we do community surveys. There's a community survey that was done um, by Aging Together um, to measure our community education, um, how we gain and apply dementia-related knowledge, and how we um, educate our people in our community on what is dementia. Um, we have outcomes and um, measurements, and we also measure our community attitudes towards dementia. So how do we learn? The collaborations have been incredible. Um, it's just, it's just in, it's so enjoyable to have people to say, how can we help? What can we do for you? Um, there are many persons in this room that we have collaborated with, and I thank you for that. Um, we collaborate with law enforcement agencies, um, other um, county and city agencies, nurse department, nurses, um, ADRC, um, professionals, all professionals providing services to older adults. We're learning and teaching together. Um, we're building relationships through, with those people, sharing our resources. What can we do to help you? Um, and then continuing education for staff and our volunteers. Um, we share our best practices. I um, get calls quite often from other states, um, other communities in Wisconsin, saying, how do you do what you do? How do you get people coordinated and organized? How do you start um, a program such as Fox Valley Memory Project? I was in Atlanta for a conference called Reinventing Life with Dementia, sponsored by the Dementia Action Alliance Group. And there I presented on our practices with the Fox Valley Memory Project. What I learned there is that we in the Fox Valley are far ahead of the curve. People didn't know what memory cafes were. Um, it was just truly amazing. But what we do here is pretty incredible, which I was not aware of. Um, we adapt to needs when we teach groups. Um, I will present to a congregation who's struggling with members um, with dementia, and how do we help them, and how do we keep them in our, in our faith community. Um, what I work with with um, a congregation is going to be very different than what I work with when I work with a business teaching them about how to communicate with their retail customers. So we need to adapt to who we're working with. Um, and sharing who we are, educating businesses through that Purple Angel program, um, education events, community education events, any outreach, church communities, um, health fairs, 
an intergenerational activity. We do a few of these that are just incredible. I, um, we collaborated with Fox Valley Christian Academy last year and the year before um, with our choir. We have a Fox Valley Memory Project choir made up of persons with dementia and their care partners. And we visited the preschool. And the kids sang us their wonderful holiday songs, and then we sang them our songs, and then we sang together. So, you know, it was a wonderful education opportunity for these children, and it was a wonderful joy opportunity for our participants who got to see these wonderful, beautiful children. So those are um, another way that we educate our community, even young people. Each one of those parents of those four-year-olds went home with some additional information about who we are and who we serve. Uh, we also maintain a very strong social presence in our community. We have a Facebook page. I don't know who said it before, but Fox Valley Memory Project. I'm working on 500 likes this year. Um, so like our page, please. Uh, we have an active website that's visited on a, on a quite often basis. And then we also host um, a newsletter that we send out to participants and to care professionals in the community that goes to almost 550 people at this point. So in general, I'm just finding that we're, you know, when I'm speaking with other groups, we're far ahead of that curve. Um, how do we continue to share our expertise? We need to continue to be involved in community conversations with dementia service providers, and that's everybody here. That's the Alzheimer's Association, that's Theta. It's, it's everybody sitting in this room. We need to keep those conversations open um, and maintain a presence at all local and state summits to offer our input based on the experience that we've had in the Fox Valley. Um, my contact information is up on the screen, and it will be in your materials. I am always um, more than um, welcoming for any of your questions and your concerns. Um, if you're living or you're um, experiencing issues with memory issues, one out of three of us work very closely with somebody with dementia. And so we're here to support you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lynn Ann. And we'll finish up with Representative Murphy. Our final speaker today is Melissa Kramer Badke. Melissa is the Principal Transportation Planner and Safe Routes to School Coordinator with the East, East Central Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission. The East Central is a 10 county uh, planning commission which includes uh, Winnebago, Outagamie, and Calumet uh, among them. Uh, Melissa oversees the Safe Routes to School program, which encourages um, kiddos to, to walk or bike to school. Um, it works with local coalitions to implement the program. She works to integrate health into transportation planning, and she serves on the local leader advisory committee for the Safe Routes to School National Partnership. Has Melissa been successful? Well, uh, since the Safe Routes program began, uh, with eight uh, school districts involved, there are now 32. And I guess uh, uh, to the math I learned here at UW Fox Valley, that'd be a 400% increase. So I think that uh, speaks for itself. So please welcome our sixth speaker today, Melissa Kramer Badke. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for the very generous welcome and um, the legislators that are here today, along with our panel of speakers who have such great expertise. And, you know, I always tell my kids that I'm always learning. You know, as adults, sometimes we forget that we're always learning. And I'm jotting notes down as I'm hearing from other speakers about ways we can collaborate more or, you know, ways that we've already collaborated with Way to the Fox Valley, Theta Care, or UW Oshkosh. So, um, thank you again for the generous welcome. So how many of you have heard of our Regional Planning Commission? I see quite a few folks. Okay, fantastic. So I'm just going to do a very brief background on our Regional Planning Commission and what we do for this particular area. 
Um, so we do serve 10 counties. Eight of those counties are member counties, which means they help provide some local funds into our organization. With those local funds, we then leverage in state and federal dollars for various programs. Those can be transportation dollars, economic development dollars, um, safe routes to school, but we really work across municipal boundaries. We work on regional programs and projects along with local programs. Um, we have three metropolitan planning organizations. How many of you know what an MPO is? Okay, an MPO means that um, we have an area in the Fox Cities that oh, has a population over 200,000. That means in order for us to bring in federal transportation dollars into that area, we have various requirements. We have to do a long-range transportation plan. We have to do a transportation improvement program, which lists all of the transportation projects, whether they're road projects, trail projects, safe routes to school projects, or transit projects that receive federal dollars into this state. Um, we also do a congestion management study, and then we work with a variety of local municipalities and counties to talk about transportation issues and land use issues in that particular area. We also serve as an economic development district, and um, we just have a variety of programs that we currently work on. Um, as was mentioned, we have 274 schools within our region. Um, this includes a tribal school as well. And we just really work with local communities on local issues that they have or local planning projects. But then we also work across municipal boundaries and really talk about the community as a whole. So what is our mission? Um, it's really just building relationships and working together to create a community that thrives and is economically prosperous. So what programs do we have at East Central? I've kind of mentioned a few of these already. Um, we do community facilities, so sewer service, area planning, water planning, um, open space recreation planning, GIS mapping. Um, how many of you have seen some beautiful GIS, like maps? Yeah, we have a GIS department that actually does that for us and creates these gorgeous maps and does some data analysis. Safe routes to school planning and environmental management. And today I'm going to really focus on some of the safe routes to school aspects and then how we've brought some of those things that we've learned into our other planning programs. So these are two images that, um, one's from UCLA, but these are images that I see quite often um, when I Google or look up some national issues regarding planning and public health. This is a really big and upcoming area about how your community is developed and what it looks like and how it may affect your individual and your community health. So when I'm talking about planning or community development, how many of you have worked with a planner or a community development director? Not too many, a couple, half maybe. Okay, so community development or planners, we work with developers, we work um, with local government agencies, with committees to decide where development's gonna go. When we're talking about development, we're talking about commercial development. Where is that store gonna go? Where is that next subdivision gonna go? Where is that road gonna go and what is it gonna look like in the future? Those are things that are gonna influence if you're gonna be able to walk or bike to school, if you are gonna be able to get to that grocery store without a car, or are you gonna be able to pick up transit that's only a mile away? Those are all sorts of things that really influence community health. And we've learned a lot from this. So my biggest example is safe routes to school. In 1969, we know that 50% of students used to walk or bike to school. Today, that percentage is down to 13%. If you go past any elementary school, middle school or high school during pickup or drop off time, <laughs> you will probably notice that there's quite a few schools that have some traffic issues going around there. And maybe if you're driving to work that time, you may actually just avoid taking that route because you don't want to get caught into that. So knowing that, how, how does that affect their health? Well, if any of you have kids or grandkids, you know that they don't sit very long for very, and have a very long attention span, right? So if they bike or walk to school, they would be able to be more focused in the morning when they sit down to learn math. Or maybe they just need to get the wiggles out. So at recess, when they go on their, um, on their school playground, there's a walking trail, and they can walk and run and just be able to get the wiggles out. And they're building in their physical activity when they bike to school, but they're also building it into the day, right? Which is gonna create them to be healthier and have healthy habits throughout their life. 
But these two images really show the built environment and how it can affect your life. If you think of underserved populations within our community and they don't have a vehicle, how are they going to get to health care services? Are they going to make that doctor's appointment if they miss the transit bus? Or are they going to be able to say, I just can't get there, I'm not going to make it? So those are all things that we consider and we work together on with a variety of partners. So Safe Routes to School really started back in 2007, at least for us. We started working with local school districts, communities, local law enforcement, um, parents, school administrators, students, and we came around the table to talk about kids and safety. How do students currently get to and from school? Typically, it's by school bus or by family vehicle. We have a couple of schools that in the Fox Valley that they only walk or bike to school and maybe have their parents drop them off every once in a while. <laughs> um, and we're not saying that you have to walk or bike every day. What we're saying is that, you know, try to make a conscious effort that on those days that you do have to pick up, maybe you park a couple blocks away and you walk with your child into school. Or you um, have a walking school bus so Sarah has been our walking school bus coordinator for one of our schools. Um, her daughter's school wanted to create a walking school bus, and so Sarah was one of our drivers. She picked up students along a particular route, walked with her daughter, and she had about 20 students on there, sometimes more than that. Um, and they did that, and it was just a great way to start your day. And that doesn't mean you have to do it every day. Maybe it's once a week, maybe it's twice a week. Um, but how did we get public health involved? You know, at that time, DOT had set the Department of Transportation, sorry, I'm a, I'm a planner, I use a lot of acronyms sometimes, um, said that we need to have public health at the table. And that was our aha moment. We had Winnebago County Health at the table and we were talking about Winnicani and their school situation and Amro, and we are talking about their Safe Routes to School situation. And they're like, well, we're looking at putting in some more trails. How are we gonna do that? I'm like, well, I can help you do that. We know how to get some of that done. So, and that sort of started building this partnership and collaboration between the public health departments. Now they always have a seat at our table. Local law enforcement have a seat at our table for safe routes. Um, fire departments have a seat at our table because who's parking in those fire lanes? How are fire trucks going to be get to a school if there's an emergency and we have lots of parents dropping off? Um, bus drivers, they have great perspective. But this really, Safe Routes was the start of including public health in our planning process. And we've now expanded that to bicycle pedestrian plans. We work together on community health improvement plans, um, complete streets policies. We've mentioned that before. We were able to bring in some national experts to talk about complete streets policies and tag teaming with Way to the Fox Valley and other partners on that. Um, Transit development plans. We have public health sitting at the table talking about specialized transportation and transit issues at the same time. And now we're bringing in healthcare organizations. So where are those future clinics going to be going? How are they going to get transportation access to those? And all of those takes partners. It takes partners and collaboration, and sometimes it takes lots of phone calls. <laughs> lots and lots of phone calls and sitting down. And usually when we have a Safe Routes to School meeting, what I say is I ask them to say their name, their organization, what they do, and why they're there. Why are you there? Because each of us brings a different perspective to the table. I don't know everything that goes on the side of law enforcement. And I don't know everything that goes on the side of school districts. Um, you know, I just, they're doing long-term expansion of their campuses to figure out their long-term planning of what that's gonna look like. Well, that's important because that could influence how um, students are getting to or from school. But it takes a lot of communication. And a lot of times, the Regional Planning Commission staff, we connect other folks, um, other organizations together. Hey, did you hear that Hortonville is doing this great walking school bus? Or did you hear that Greenville is doing a walking school bus from their park? And they have 60 students on their walking school bus, and that's helping to eliminate some of that traffic over there. Um, and they're like, well, how do they do that? I'm like, here, here's their phone number. Why don't you give them a call? You guys would be great to talk to each other. So a lot of times it's about collaboration. It's about co communicating and figuring out those best practices. 
I am lucky enough to sit on a national steering committee advisory committee for the Safe Rest of School National Partnership. I was elected into that position um, about six or seven years ago when Deb Hubsmith, the former executive director, said, hey, we want you to be on here. We want you to represent rural school districts in your Safe Rest of School program. It was a little intimidating, I'm not going to lie, because <laughs> there were representatives from all across the country. Marin County, California, they had one of the first Safe Rouse to School programs in the country. But we all learn from each other. We really talk about different issues that, and challenges we have, and we learn from each other. I've learned a lot from public health, I have to say. One-on-one um, -on -one meetings, logic models, they still might not be my favorite, but I've learned how to use them. Um, we talk with national and state colleagues. Um, in, Minis in Michigan, they were doing a project that's very similar to our College Avenue project. And they were looking at a corridor that was very, very similar. And they said, how did you get public health in the room? And this is the Michigan DOT. And I said, well, I called a couple of people and I said, you know, we're doing this project. Can you think of anything that might influence community health? Oh yeah, we got a couple of ideas, you know, physical activity, trying to get out to the community partnership health clinic out there, um, plus all of those jobs in the industrial area, how are folks supposed to get out there? So it's really just about communication and collaboration. Um, some of the projects that we've worked with, we have so many great colleagues up here on the panel, UW Oshkosh. Their nursing program, one of their aggregate projects was to set up a walking school bus for us in the Menasha Area School District. So the students took on that entire project and set that up. Um, we've worked with Leadership Fox Cities on Project Radar, which is reminding all drivers about responsibility in school zones and reminding folks to slow down. Um, it was a tremendous partnership, and that came out of um, some of the work that we had done with trying to raise awareness about slowing down in school zones. Um, we're currently working on the planner, plan for health and working with Health Tide, and Jen's here, um, about doing a planning assessment. How are we incorporating planning and health into comprehensive planning, into our transportation planning? So if we're, we're doing a roadway project and we're working with a local community, what questions are we raising to ensure that there's sidewalks or bike lanes or transit stops along that, and to ensure that community members can actually cross that roadway to get to the grocery store to eat those nutritional foods or be able to access the healthcare services um, if they live in a particular community. Um, we've talked about trails and increasing physical activity. Um, it's just a wide array, and we just continue to learn through social media, through webinars. Um, I have, there's nine regional planning commissions in Wisconsin, and I outreach to them. I'm like, hey, we have this issue, this problem. How have you guys dealt with it? Um, I have counterparts in Madison and Milwaukee. For Safe Routes to School, we've had phone calls from California, Arizona, and Washington, D.C., saying, how have you started your regional Safe Routes to School program? How have you gotten all of those folks sitting at the table? And it's been phone calls behind the scenes, a lot of phone calls. Um, and it's been asking why they want to be at the table. You know, it has to be mutually beneficial if we're going to collaborate. And it's trying to find those key pieces of information um, to make sure that we are on the same page and to make sure that when we're sitting at the table, we're all working to the better good. So in our work at the Regional Planning Commission, I understand it's very broad and it's very overview, and I'd be happy to discuss any of the work that we've done. Um, but we have found a lot of unexpected connections with a variety of organizations and partner organizations. And while each of us brings a different perspective to the table with different priorities, we cannot do this work alone. And together, we can help provide, improve the health of our community here in the Fox Valley. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa, for that presentation. We covered a lot of ground today, uh, and I appreciate everyone uh, sitting through uh, and, and here on a fall day. Um, we're going to take a little time before we uh, leave for some question and answers. I'll uh, invite anybody from the co-host, legislators from the co-host panel, if you have a, a comment or a question to start off, and then if there's others in the audience who would like to join in, uh, we have a microphone on this side and one on this side. So. Um, Open it up here, up, up front first, if, sure. Thank you. So, 
I introduced Sarah today, and, and um, we're talking about the uh, uh, Wait in the Fox Valley program and the, the um, farm to school type program and stuff. And as I think about what we're doing here today, um, we talk about evidence-based health policy. And one of the things I found very frustrating about uh, the area of nutrition and diet was <laughs> the fact that the science seemed to change constantly. Uh, one example would be you know, as little as probably uh, 10 years ago or so, there were uh, state governments uh, passing laws about uh, the use of um, palm or coconut oil in, uh, in movie theater popcorn because it was unhealthy. Today you can walk into a health food store and find coconut oil on the shelf as a health food product um, because you know, there's been a complete change. So I guess what I'm saying is we've gone, you know, there were some very dramatic moves made by government in that situation to, to change something and then we find out that really it, it wasn't based on good evidence and so how do we, uh, how do we go about making sure that the, the science and the evidence that we're using is, is appropriate? Sarah, there's a microphone in the middle there, yeah. Is it on? Can you hear me? Okay, great. That's a great question, and I love diving right into that and food <laughs> and policy because that is tricky. And also, what is healthy and how do we define that? And there isn't a day that goes by that we aren't talking about this with our partners. And it's frustrating for community members too because they do hear different things, whether it's you know the latest fad or the latest research or differences amongst who we call the experts. So one of the important ways that we've looked at that is where do we all agree and where do we know that there's evidence and that we can agree and make a difference for people. And so one of those areas, for example, is around um, fruits and vegetables. You know, while there's still some controversy or there too, we do know that if um, we increase the vegetable consumption, and the, the statistics, by the way, are dire, um, but if we can do that, it's gonna have an impact for people. We know that um, you know, sugar-sweetened beverages is a problem, is a challenge, so how do we, and water is good for you and healthy, and how do we increase the water intake of people? So how do we look at the positive behaviors and really focus on those positive things and where we have agreement and we can really move the needle on things? And those other things will come. Um, we still need to follow the research. You know, policy is, again, tricky, especially when we look at, like, legislation. Um, but local policies have been proven successful around that. You know, in there are organizations that say, Let's bring healthy foods in for people. Let's bring some, um, you know, of those things and, and maybe not have to tempt people with some of the others. Maybe have healthier options in our vending. So I think building that policy at the local level and then building up that momentum in education is a good way to do that. Other questions from? Okay, I have a question, might be more for Melissa, uh, just in terms of the budget where we're at right now with having a late budget, with some of the controversy, especially around transportation funding. How is it, are you guys looking at that impacting you at all or somewhat, or I guess can you just address maybe how at the state level in particular the budget impacts your activities and what you're doing right now? So right now with Safe Routes, to, we receive um, a couple of different funding sources for the Planning Commission to work on transportation activities. Um, one is the Transportation Alternatives Program. That is the funding that is utilized to do the Safe Routes to School planning. The region, reason the Regional Safe Routes to School Program was started is because initially when the program was first started, at the DOT was that it was school districts had to and communities had to apply to do a plan. And then once they got that plan done, then they had to reapply to do infrastructure improvements. So infrastructure meaning changing some of the roadways, you know, adding some signage. Then they had to, or they could apply for non-infrastructure funding, which was education, encouragement, enforcement, and evaluation. And so every time that we had to wait for another grant cycle to be able to apply, communities lost momentum or got frustrated with the process. So us at the Regional Planning Commission, we take care of all of the federal paperwork <laughs> and work with the local communities 
to talk about what programs fit best for their school and their community. Now that might be just doing walk to school day on October 4th, for example. Other, other schools are doing walking school bus programs, or maybe they're adjusting some of their busing policies. Um, and it, we just make it a menu as to what is going to be successful in their community or what their community is ready for. Um, from a transportation perspective, we receive federal and state dollars in to do the Metropolitan Planning Organization um, activities. And those are federally mandated. Like we have to do those. Otherwise, our local communities are not going to receive federal funding to do projects. So when I'm talking about projects, I'm talking about um, US 10, 441, Oneida Street next year will be reconstructed. Those are some federal funds that will be utilized. That's um, surface transportation program dollars. Um, and so, and some of the larger projects like 15 and some of those other things, there may be federal dollars attached to that. And how is that going to affect our local communities and what they've been planning for in the future? But then also how is that going to affect our role as the MPO to be able to work with local communities to plan for transportation for the future and help with economic development. So there's a lot of like complex pieces um, and it just a little bit of you know, not concerned, but just trying to figure out all of the state budget pieces that go with transportation planning. I'd be happy to talk with you offline in more detail about that. Probably have time for one more question. If Representative Rorkast would have anything you want to add, or then I'll look out in the look out in the audience. Probably apologize for the tight time, but we have probably time for one one question. Back in the corner. This is a broad question that gives you a chance to, they just, some of the legislators asked you questions and now you have an opportunity to respond, or to ask them. So, and it's based to some degree on what Paula Morgan argued, um, that roughly 80% of what affects health doesn't come out of the clinical sector, the medical care sector, it comes from other places. But if we look at where the resources go, the vast majority of them go to the medical care sector, for example, even in this area, if we take the, the amount we spend that goes into Theta Care and its affiliates or Ascension and its local affiliates, we're well in excess of a billion dollars, and yet each of your organizations that you would be rounding error for them. So my question for you is, what would you suggest how we move the resources upstream where they can be more effective instead of having them continue to go at the downstream more intensive end where all of the problems have already taken place and the only solutions left are expensive ones? Let anyone tackle that one. <laughs> I think providing funding for public health. Public health is an area that the funding has shrunk, and they're trying to do more with less resources. Um, I see that in the public health agencies that I visit. I think that shift towards prevention is something that has to happen in order to bring health care expenses down that are due to acute illness. And, and uh, just to add to that, reimbursement. Um, reimbursement today is um, all about the procedures, and there's a shift to moving from being paid for um, uh, value as opposed to volume, um, and that, that trend needs to continue regardless of what administration is, is in our nation's capital or, or in the state. Um, that shift has started, and, and that's the incentive to keep people healthy in the first place. Um, so more reimbursement for um, upstream efforts, prevention efforts, um, and then um, making sure that we focus on um, the incentives, the right incentives to incentivize the healthcare systems to get it right the first time and not be um, paid for the more procedures they do, but for incentivized to keep people healthy in the first place. Thanks for that uh, response. And that's probably all the time we have for today. Um, but before we go, uh, I hope that as you listened, you picked up on some of the common threads that ran through all six of our speakers. Um, the importance of learning from your partners, learning through collaboration, um, the importance of data and evaluation and assessing what success looks like, and the regional, statewide, uh, and national reach of the best practices and lessons that are being learned here on the ground at the Fox Valley. Um, before we go, I'd like to say a couple of quick thank yous first uh, to the UW Madison Chancellor's Office. Wisconsin Partnership Program and ICTER for making this uh, event possible, making it free and open to the public. 
I know I had to take off, but thanks to uh, Dr. Rudd and the staff uh, here at UW Fox for this wonderful venue and making this a really easy day for everybody. Um, thanks to our legislative co-hosts for your participation, uh, and also I'd like to recognize Representative Paul Tittle is here, as well as staff from uh, Senator Roger Roth's office. Uh, and also I saw staff from Senator, <laughs> uh, Senator Ron Johnson's office was also uh, in, in the room today. So I think we're linking local, state, and federal policymaking into the, the campus uh, uh, venue here. Um, finally, thanks to all of you in the audience uh, for joining us and for your ongoing work in the community. Um, and for joining us today to discuss and think about what it means to learn and to teach on the ground and how we can all do that together uh, in the spirit of those kinds of idea, community, campus, and policymakers. So with a friendly reminder to fill out those yellow eval forms, I'll, uh, I'll wish you all a wonderful day and thanks very much. <laughs>